Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Dr. Coffee is back, our resident coffee expert. How are you doing, Dr. Coffee? It's another day above ground drinking coffee, my friend. Nothing gets better than that. What more could you ask for? I got my purity coffee right here, slurping it down. What do you take? You take your coffee black, right? I take my coffee different ways. So right, right, right. now I am enjoying a cold brew that I made, oh. uh, which is just delicious. Nice. See, I got to get into that cold stuff. I just do a little splash of cream and I'm off. Um, and that's pertinent today, today's show, because on the coffee, health and science podcast, we talk a lot about health, you know, Dr. Coffee dropping the health knowledge. We talk a lot about science with a lot of different experts coming on, but I also do like to cover coffee itself, the history of coffee, uh, coffee flavors, um, everything about coffee, because you know, it is the coffee, health and science podcast after all. Today's an interesting (laughs) one though, because we're talking about taste. We're talking about coffee connoisseurs, or rather, as you put it, coffee snobs, uh, which is which is really quite funny. But before we embark on this journey of talking about specialty coffees and you know some of the world's goofiest coffees out there, Dr. Steve, what can you tell us about coffee snobbery and coffee taste as a whole? So there are two words I want people to understand. The first word is connoisseur. And the second word is snobbery. (laughs) Okay. So a connoisseur is somebody that enjoys their craft and, and hones their skills and is considered a, um, expert or at least well-versed in their field. Mm -hmm. Then there's snobbery (laughs) and snobbery is where, you have an attitude about what you do, but maybe not have the expertise. Ah. And there's something called the National Coffee Association of the United States of America. And every year they put out their survey results. And of course, I have to read the survey results because you wouldn't be Dr. Coffee without doing that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so... Our statistics in this country keep changing so that we are showing that we're drinking more and more specialty coffee. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go over with everybody today, what is specialty coffee and what is the difference between somebody drinking specialty coffee and being a coffee connoisseur? Mm Mm-hmm. Are you up for that? So up for it, man. Break down specialty coffee <laughs> first, because we know when we're drinking crappy, you know, coffee, but what is what is the actual line for specialty coffee? So um, when we talk about specialty coffee, we're starting out talking about the unroasted green coffee beans. And um, they must have no more than eight full defects in 300 grams to be considered a specialty coffee. Whoa. Now a defect, that's like a messed up bean or some sort of malformity. Exactly. Okay. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty high standards. It is. Um, and then the second high standard that you have, the second bar you have to go over is that they must possess at at least one distinctive attribute in in body, flavor, aroma, or acidity. Oh, wow. I think I have that all right. It's hard keeping all these things in my head, but I think that's right. <laughs> and the Coffee Specialty Association labels specialty coffee anything with a cupping score of 80 or above, and it's uh, up to a score of 100. Mm-hmm. So they really put their faith in the t- in the tasters. Yes. So today we have to talk about some of the things that are found in coffee and some of the things that are scientific and some of the things that are um, related to a person's um, skill mm. in developing a taste. Mm-hmm. 
Oh. Does that make sense to you? So much, please. Yes, dive right in. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear about this because you know the the bottom line is usually. I mean, look at purity. When you go and you focus on making a food product, especially about any product, naturally, you know, as as specialty grade as you can get, it naturally turns out very delicious. But I'm I'm excited to hear your breakdown on where where the differences lie. Okay, so let's start by talking about the changes that have occurred in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll start with African Americans. Uh, the gourmet coffee drinking and gourmet and specialty are considered the synonymous terms. Okay, is up seven percent this year. Mm. Oh uh, wow! African Americans yeah. over a year. That's that's a pretty big bump. It is, and uh, they're somewhere around forty percent of African Americans that drink coffee responded that they drink. Um, specialty coffee. Interesting. Very interesting. Older people. So people who are surveyed 60 or older, 72% drink specialty coffee. Whoa. Wow. Between the age of 18 and 24, only 47% said they um, drink a specialty coffee. Hmm. Interesting. Um, drip coffee. Drip coffee is losing ground. Uh, that's a pun with the ground. Um, <laughs> so 45% of the respondents in the survey last year said they had sipped coffee brewed in a drip machine. Uh-huh. In 2012, it was 61%, so a drop of 16 points since 2012. Wow. And now is that because of all the cure eggs out there and, or are people into the French press? What's going on there? Um, it's a, you know, it's a fundamental shift in the American landscape that is changing towards looking at drinking coffee in different ways. And I like cold brew, as I've said before, but people know what cold brew is. It's just not very popular. Yeah. Right. Right. So 80% of the respondents said they know what cold brew is, but only 20% drank it regularly. That's me, man. That's me. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just really not in my, uh, in my arsenal. It's funny how these things are changing, though. So you brought up the uh, single serve, which is the Keurig brand. There's um, other brands out there, um, but the single serve pods... And I think Purity makes a pod coffee as well. Um, only 43% were satisfied with um, single-serve coffee. Mm, interesting. So Keurig is down 14 points from 2015. Huh. And it's a trend that is happening because of a number of reasons. First of all, there is no doubt that the single-serve um, it is easy. You walk over, you put the pot in, you close the lid, you push the button for the size you want, and it's done. Right. The, the problems are we're killing our resources because the pods are not recyclable. Right. Now, Purity does make, and there are a couple others that make a recyclable pod, but nobody recycles it to my knowledge. And the right. reason is, is you have to clean out the coffee and you have to take off the lid on the pod because it's not recyclable. Right. And if you're drinking Keurig type coffee because you want it expedient. And then you have to stop and sleepily wash out your... <laughs> <laughs> your cup and then yeah. throw it. Yeah. That, that is an extra step that probably is a uh, detriment to the original intent. Exactly. So, um, Keurig is not a, a ecological sustainable system. And that's not a good thing in today's market when, especially my generation is really focused on stuff like that. Well, whether you believe in climate change or not, which I do, and the farmers who farm coffee, the specialty farmers, will tell you that the changes in environment is hurting business. It's making it much harder oh, wow. uh, to grow specialty coffee. Because, you know, 
coffee has to be grown at a certain elevation and a certain moisture. It, 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 the only state in the United States that really grows coffee is Hawaii because they have the climate for it. Mm -hmm. There may be some places in Sonoma or Napa that uh, try their hand with coffee, but it's really only grown at a certain elevation. And when you change the climate due to climate change, if you believe in it, which I do, um, and science does too, then you're making it harder for the farmers to, you know, grow their coffee beans. Very delicate um, um, growing environment, it seems. It is because you want, you, you know, um, and we'll talk at some type about some of the weird coffees that are, that are out there that are very expensive, but in the underlying theme of those coffees, it is that maturity. So coffee trees take at least five years to mature enough to grow the coffee beans properly. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. So you don't plug coffee uh, bushes or trees into the ground and uh, expect the next year you're going to get a good batch. It doesn't work that way. That's tough. I got to tell you, five years, that's a tough investment. It is, and that's just to get started. So if you're now facing too much rain, too little rain, too heat, too much heat, uh, not enough um, uh, sunshine coming through too much. I mean, if you're facing all those changes in the environment, it makes it really hard to grow. Anyway, we digressed. Let me go back to the fact that Kirk is losing ground mm -hmm. uh, here in this country. Um, and I don't, I bet on the convenience, but I don't bet on the long haul for Curry to be the uh, number one winner anymore. Fascinating. Um, Drip is not also the number one winner, though I've got to tell anybody that hasn't had, what's the name of that coffee maker that's a glass funnel with the wooden Chemex? So if you're using a Chemex, if you've never used one, you should buy one and try it. It's a wonderful product. The um, paper filters that come for it are really good. They don't impart any real taste. They don't change the taste of coffee. They're really easy to use. Um, a Chemex is what I would call a decent drip uh, machine. It's a manual, so there's no plugging it in. Mm, yeah, these look um, really I nice. Think everybody, yeah, I think everybody should have that in their coffee ar armament. Um, but you have cappuccino machines, which are espresso machines, which use a uh, forced uh, vapor to push through the coffee. I think vapor cigarettes versus <laughs> vapor coffee <laughs> is a very similar concept. You're pushing uh, steam through the beans to extract. You get less caffeine. You get a nice taste. So people are really moving towards the... Um, towards the uh, cappuccino more mm -hmm. um, than drip. Uh, Chemex is good. Cold press is good. Uh, French press is great. It's real convenient. Mm -hmm. I uh, see more and more of that French press is, is big amongst the, the hipster crowd. Sure. <laughs> sure. If I were purity, I'd make a, um, I'd make a traveling French press that you could – have a rail on the side in which you keep your ground coffee and a rail on the side in which you can keep your um, sweetener if you use a sweetener. And You're like a Civil War? Like you got your musket packer and your, you know, your, your <laughs> ammo horn? Dr. Exactly. Steve goes around with his coffee horn and his collagen powder and MCT oil. Exactly. <laughs> and then all you need is hot water to pour in and you make it out of something in a, in a steel. So it's unbreakable and you can carry it in and make fresh coffee whenever you want it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Back to taste though. Do you want to move on to maybe talk about um, cupping a little bit or do you have more to say on forms of consumption? Nope, I'm right there with you. So cupping is one of the most important skills somebody can develop if you're going to be in the coffee industry. Um, if you're a green coffee buyer, then you have to know cupping. There's no getting around it. Mm -hmm. It's the same as 
a wine connoisseur uh, having the nose and the palate to evaluate a fine Cabernet, let's say. So Cupper, Cuppers use a strict uh, group of protocols uh, to look for the quality of their cup of cupping. Mm-hmm. If you're going to set up a cupping lab, then you need five cupping glasses, a well-lit area, a silver cupping spoon. You can't do it without the silver cupping spoon. Oh. The, water, the water has to be somewhere around 200 degrees, plus or minus five degrees. You need a good bean grinder. We only recommend a burr grinder. Um, and then you need... Um, a, a small roaster, so you're going to roast the beans. Um, terminology used with uh, cupping, fragrance, which is the ar- aromatic aspects of coffee, mm-hmm. aroma. So the difference between fragrance and aroma is fragrance is the dry coffee. Aroma oh. is the brewed coffee. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a big one. That's, an, that's one I've never heard before, putting that one in the bank. <laughs> fragrance and aroma. Yeah, no, I've so never heard you, that difference. You know, my when I grind my coffee in the morning, my wife always goes, oh, I love the smell of that. What she's talking about is the fragrance. Do you correct her? And then, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> no, because she just doesn't use the term fragrance. <laughs> anyway, the brightness or sourness of a coffee we call acidity. The presence in the mouthfeel we call body Mm. the tones of the coffee when you hear people say it's got um a full body tone that we call flavor the the mouthfeel that leaves you with the sweetness of the coffee versus the bitterness we call that sweetness Mm -hmm. the um balance so that no uh, one one taste overbalances another. You don't drink it and say this is really bitter. Right. Um, that's called balance. After you've tasted your coffee, the taste that resides in your mouth, the positive flavor we call it the aftertaste, and then there's the overall rating for the coffee. So when these cuppers are grading them, do they have kind of an added tally point system for each one, or do they consider all of those things and then give a final ranking? They consider all those things, and um, it's all based on a 100-point scale, and each one is based on their 10 parameters or 10 points. So you would give um, uh, a score of seven to one and a five to the other and they add up and you have to get somewhere wow. around 85 to really be called considered a specialty coffee. Now, surprisingly, it seems like these connoisseurs really do have their stuff figured out, meaning cuppers will cup different cop, uh, coffees similarly independent of one another. Do you find that to be the case? Like they really do have this stuff down. They do. I mean, uh, you can have two cuppers and one might enjoy it more than the other. And so that'll rate into their taste. But there's a lot in which there's really standards for. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when we, for example, when we prepare the coffee, um, we have to roast it to a light to medium roast. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the first uh, value that we'll give is called the Agstrom. And that's a score between 55 and 65, um, in which you're really talking about the, um, the color of the, uh, of the roast. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, and, um, in fact, you don't have to rely on taste for that. You can buy discs, uh, that serve as a reference point. Oh, uh, like a, like color swatches. Understand. Yeah, <laughs> man, these cuppers take it seriously. I love it. Yep. Yeah. So then uh, you go through preparing the infusion after you know you're you've um, roasted it correctly and that you're in the right color range. 
you go through uh, preparing the infusion. Uh, there's a certain amount of grams of coffee that you add to a certain amount of water. I won't bore everybody with all the <laughs> details. And then um, you, br- you begin cupping. You make sure that the temperature is the right temperature. Um, 92 to 96 uh, degrees centigrade, which is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you start recording. You make note of the defects, the faults, and then you give a classification scale and 85 to 89 is specialty, 80 to 84 is premium, uh, 90 to 94 is premium specialty, and 95 to 100 is super premium. What percentage of coffees land in that zone, that really, really high specialty zone? Where do most coffees land? So, you know, there are three types of coffees on the marketplace. Uh, One of the coffees are the canned coffees, um, like your Maxwell House. I'm not trying to disparage anything when I give a name. I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands what we're really talking about. So Mm -hmm. your canned coffees, most people don't know this, but a canned coffee can be nine years old. Wow. Wow. So it could have been roasted and ground nine years ago, put into cans and eventually shipped off. 2010. Um, (laughs) 2010 coffee, baby. Yep. Even though we've become coffee snobs, where we're drinking specialty coffee, the majority of the world is still not drinking specialty coffee. Mm, right. And um, when I said, you know, 40% of like the African Americans are drinking specialty coffee, I mean, 60% aren't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's one. Then your medium grade are going to be the ones that. Don't fall into a specialty grade like Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So Starbucks is everywhere. It's prevalent. Louis Black, one of my favorite comedians, makes a joke about walking out of a Starbucks with his friend who has Alzheimer's. And they look across the street (laughs) and his friend says, oh, look, it's a Starbucks. Let's go have a cup of coffee. (laughs) It's true, man. (laughs) So Starbucks is, you know, a medium great coffee. They don't go to great, great lengths to make sure that all the green coffee beans are super specialty. And, uh, they, you know, burn their roast a lot of times they over roast and, uh, it's a medium grade. So you have lots of coffees like that. And then you have really the true specialties. And then you have what, uh, what are called the super specialties, uh, and that would be like uh, purity coffee, in which um, everything, the super premium specialties, everything that they do from start to finish goes in to making it a medicinal grade coffee. Mm-hmm. No wonder that it comes out so delicious. Just to give you guys a little bit of uh, reference, if you're drinking a can of coffee on the shelf from nine years ago, it will be as old as the iPad 1. The iPad 1 came out in 2010, and that is when your coffee was made. (laughs) I thought you'd like that, Dr. Steve. I love that. I love that. Oh, this was great, man. Do you want to wrap it up here? You want to talk about anything else you want to add? Maybe we can talk some uh, weird coffees, expensive coffees, before we wrap up, if you'd like? That would be great. I would love to. So, in case you really want to become a coffee snob. So remember we talked about a connoisseur, those that really know their craft, um, and can really taste like a wine connoisseur Mm -hmm. can really taste coffee. Like I hope I am. Um, (laughs) that takes time and training though, versus a snob, you can jump right in. That's the benefit. (laughs) You can, you can. So if you're a coffee snob, then I want to give you some coffees that you should consider buying. (laughs) The first one is the Formosan Rock Monkey Coffee. (laughs) So the rock monkeys are in the mountains of Taiwan, and they eat the ripe coffee cherries and then spit out the seeds. 
Oh. So the seeds, in, pe- in case people don't know or remember from one of my earlier podcasts, coffee is a fruit. In the center of the fruit is a seed. The seed is what we call coffee beans. They're really not beans. They're really seeds. Mm-hmm. And that's what we grind. So so uh, these monkeys do the work for us is what you're saying. <laughs> they, they do. So you get a saliva-infused bean. You clean yeah. them up. You sell them for a lot of money, and the regurgitated beans make a sweet coffee with a vanilla-like scent, and the coffee sells for over $50 a pound. Have you tried this coffee? That one I haven't, but I've tried the other one. a couple other ones, which we're going to mention. So (laughs) the next one is Kopi Luwak. Oh, no, this one I've heard of, I think. This is, yeah, Yeah, go on. Kopi Luwak is poop coffee. Yes. Yes. I've heard of this one. <laughs> yeah, yep. So um, a civet, C-I-V-E-T. Is what are they, are they like marsupials? Creature. Oh, cat-like creatures. Okay. Yeah. They're a feral Indonesian civic. They're a cat-like creature. <laughs> they roam coffee plantations and they gorge on ripe coffee cherries. <laughs> they ingest them, digest them, and then poop them. So the workers then harvest the beans from the poop, clean them up, hopefully, uh, before bagging. And this is one of the most expensive coffees in the world. It was the most expensive, but something else took the 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 first mantle, the first place. And I'll go over that in a a minute. Um, But the poop coffee, the the lemur coffee, have you tried it? I have. (laughs) How was it? It was very good. Really? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the the digestive tract of the civet really uh, <laughs> it, ferments the the, it ferments the seed, mm-hmm. which reduces the acidity. And in this Darwinian tr- trick, the civets really only eat the best coffee cherries. They're coffee snobs. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. No, I never thought about that. The ones that they choose to eat will affect the quality of the of the end coffee. Yep. So you've got these the harvest workers that are picking up the, the poop from the civet and they're cleaning it up and they're packaging these really wonderful seeds that sell for over $400 a pound. <laughs> it's crazy. The third one is what I call weasel puke coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Enlighten me, please. So, Vietnamese weasels <laughs> are bulimic. Okay. Um, they eat their coffee cherries and then regurgitate them. They puke them. So you get uh, this coffee, this you, they clean up the disgusting part, and unless you consider puke to be disgusting, you don't have to eat the poop coffee. You can eat the weasel puke <laughs> yeah, coffee. Big step up. <laughs> and they what do they they find they find this in the wild and collect it? Yes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is wild! And then brew it right up. Exactly. <laughs> How much does that run for? Do you have a price on that one? Um, it's it's very hard to find, and it really is 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 not out there. Like um, Kopi Luwak is out there; you can find it. The Rock Monkey Coffee is hard to find. Weasel Puke is very difficult to find. This is the real stuff. You got to go to Vietnam. Yep. <laughs> That's crazy, well, then man. you can also, if you can't go there, you can also go to the rainforest in Brazil. And if you go to the rainforest in Brazil, there's an endangered pheasant-like bird uh, called the jacu. And the jacu eats ripe coffee berries and then um, poops them out. So this is jacu poop coffee, and it sells for about $250 a pound. Jeez. (laughs) That's wild. I got one last one. Hit me. Okay. This is called Elephant Dung Coffee. (laughs) It's now the most expensive coffee in the world. Oh, wow. It can sell up to 
fifteen hundred dollars a pound. Jeez. So are elephants eating coffee? Be- so elephant um, elephants eat coffee, and then poops them out, and then you have to sort through Jeez. <laughs> all that poop, <laughs> all that elephant poop for a couple beans. That's right. <laughs> and something about their digestive system makes it taste different than the lemur coffee, or the civet coffee. And it's, it does. It's, wow. It ferments in, in elephant poop, which. Uh, elephants eat a lot of leaves and and yeah, rough and stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> That's a good point. And so it comes out very earthy. It comes out with very low acidity. Wow. And uh, and you now have a new coffee that's out there that's much more than any of the others. Wow. Elephant dung coffee, the world's most expensive coffee. <laughs> so we'll end with that, my friend. To everybody out there, enjoy your coffee, even if it's in a can. <laughs> Love it. Thank you all so much for listening. Dr. Steve, thank you for taking the time to do this, my friend. My pleasure. Have a great day. All right, everybody. Dr. Stephen Hellshine, a.k.a. Dr. Coffee, and Jordan River signing off, saying we'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Coffee.